Good morning. Welcome to West Point Community Church. For those that are especially grieving today, um, as Cam mentioned, um, the news, uh, let me just read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Would you join me in prayer? Uh, Father, thank you for this time together to gather, to worship you, to both celebrate your goodness and to recognize the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Father, again, we pray for family, the families and friends that are grieving. Uh, on this day, we know that many are meeting even now, um, reflecting, comforting, uh, remembering, honoring. And so, Father, just continue to surround um, your people with your presence. Father, prepare us as we look into your word and as we prepare for a new year that is before us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy new year, everyone. Welcome to the much-anticipated 2021. I think a lot of us have been looking forward to this time for a while, uh, hoping to put 2020 behind us. I think the sentiment has been that once 2020 is gone, then life will become a bit more bearable. Well, as you know, 2021 is already here. We find that not much has changed since Thursday in, in many regards. COVID still leads the way in news and headlines. Our church is still restricted to 15%. And unfortunately for my wife, the beard that I began growing in 2020 is still here in 2021. And so the magic wand of a new calendar year may not be as potent as we had hoped. And yet I would like us to look at 2020 in a bit of a different light this morning. 2020 for me personally has probably shaped and refined me more than any other year of my life as a pastor. From 2004 to the present, this year, 2020, that has just passed, has impacted me more than any other year, not in harmful ways, but for the good. And so we will be in God's word this morning, but allow me to just take you down memory lane here for a few moments. 2020 for us at West Point began with preaching through 1 John. We looked at the importance of having a biblical faith in Jesus Christ. I shared that some of us at that time, and maybe some of us here today, may have a faith worth losing. I shared that some of us may have a, a faith in faith, a faith that in the end all will go well. But unfortunately, there is no subject to that faith, and so it is a faith worth losing. I shared that some have a health and wealth faith that believes that in the end God owes me something for all of my good behavior. Again, it is a faith worth losing. Or a faith that believes that Jesus is my personal genie to give me my best life now. Or some may have a faith that is really just a faith in yourself you only use Jesus as a guide or as a moral teacher or a personal trainer. All of these examples of, are examples of a faith that is not worth holding on to. They are not rooted in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Our key text for that series was 1 John 5, 1 to 5, and so let me read it for you. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. 
This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And so in that series, we looked at the benefits and the blessings of biblical faith. Biblical faith brings assurance of salvation. Biblical faith brings boldness in prayer. It brings victory over sin and Satan. And it brings security in our Savior. That series concluded in February. And then in March, I laid out my plans for sabbatical. I shared on that first Sunday of March of some of the goals and objectives that I had. And I also introduced our new sermon series in 1 Thessalonians, um, not anticipating that I would be preaching in that series. Two days later, I was in California, taking in my first ever Shepherds Conference at Grace Community Church, where John MacArthur has pastored for the last 51 years. 51 years at one church. Just what a testimony of faithfulness to God and to his church. And for those that know who John MacArthur is, just as a side note, he is, he is now 81 years old and preaching strong. Shepherd's Conference is a conference for men in church leadership to be challenged in their commitment to biblical ministry to find encouragement as they serve as shepherds and as servants of the chief shepherd. And so my time at that conference was a time of being challenged and encouraged to serve biblically and faithfully as a shepherd to this church. As just a, another aside, uh, March 3 to 5 is the next conference. I think the theme is... Uh, very important. It is reclaiming true evangelicalism. And I would love for some of our elders to attend, especially if they bring me with them. Well, a week after I returned from that time away, uh, the COVID lockdowns began. I ended my sabbatical. I went on to preach more than I have ever preached before. Again, uh, both a challenge and a blessing. We worked through First and Second Thessalonians. Again, a, a tremendous challenge. There were difficulties along the way, pretty difficult letters to work through. I was reminded of the many things that I don't know. There is much to learn. But in the midst of that time, we were reminded many times <clears throat> of the purifying power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that our lives are to be different in light of who Christ is and what he has called us to as his followers. We tackled some prickly subjects, if you remember. We had a message on church discipline. We discussed the Christian's work ethic. We tackled the dangers of selfishness. We even grappled with the topic of the return of Christ and the events involved with that event. <clears throat> then we got to September and we embarked on our <clears throat> journey, excuse me, <clears throat> journey through the book of Exodus. Again, another rich blessing for us as a church, seeing God's big redemptive story laid out for us to see, to marvel at. We got to see the types and shadows in the Old Testament pointing to the fulfillment in Christ. We learned of things like the tabernacle and the items placed in the Ark of the Covenant and seeing that these symbols again find their fulfillment in our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the great high priest. He is the perfect spotless lamb. He is the deliverer. He is the redeemer and restorer of all things. And so 2020 was full of learning and discovering and shaping God is indeed forming a people for himself to represent him in our world. 
And on top of all of this, all that we uh, looked at and wrestled through in our sermon series, there was much more that we wrestled with. I don't think we would have ever imagined that 2020 would be the year that we would spend time learning about the role of governments, of when or if they have overstepped their authority. I don't think we would ever have thought that 2020 would be the year that our elders board would find themselves wrestling with when or if civil disobedience would be required of us as a church. We never would have thought that 2020 would be the year that we would hear about a global and great reset that some of the elite in the world appear to be pushing for. We also saw that many words and teachings that were already in existence became much more prevalent and mainstream in 2020. And when I say that, I'm referring to things like critical race theory, becoming woke, Black Lives Matter, white privilege, social justice, progressive Christianity, the cosmic Christ. Some of these you may be familiar with, some may be completely foreign to you, but these are ideologies that are affecting our culture, and I do not believe they are affecting our culture for good. We never would have thought that 2020 would be the year where our culture would work hard to redefine words, words like racism or pro-life or tolerance or gender or hate speech or even salvation or atonement or even what salvation in Jesus Christ is. And so words and ideas and ideologies and philosophies, they matter because they have consequences. Therefore, the church must educate itself so that it can respond biblically to what our culture is throwing at us, and it is throwing a lot at us right now. And so if nothing else, 2020 has been a wake-up call. Specifically, I believe 2020 is a wake-up call to the church, The church, in many respects, found itself ill-prepared to navigate in these cultural waves and storms. The Apostle Paul, he urged the church to be built up in unity and in the knowledge of the Son of God, becoming mature and complete in Christ. We read that in Ephesians 4.13, and then the very next verse, Ephesians 4.14, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. So welcome to 2021. The church, us together, must be committed to the process of maturity or else we get ragdolled by the world, tossed back and forth. Jesus said that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus said that we are to be salt and light in the world. But he also said that if the salt loses its saltiness, of what benefit is it? I believe this is the reality of the church in 2021. If we are to be salty, then we must be educated enough with our world, knowing what our world is talking about, and then be prepared to address the teachings of our day, refute them when and where there is error, and correct them with truth. I do not believe the church should be silent or indifferent to the cultural changes in our world. We are to be salt and light. That means that we are required to engage in the public square, For many, including myself, this is not necessarily the Christianity that I grew up with, but I believe it is the Christianity that is required. The beautiful thing is, is that we have the authority of God's word at our fingertips. We have the sufficient, inspired word of God in our hands. We have the author of life and truth and society and purpose and reconciliation in our midst. We have the Holy Spirit within us to guide us into all truth. 
Although there are some in the Christian faith that would seek to distance themselves from this corrupt world, I believe Christ has called us to engage and confront and love the world that God has made for his glory and for his purposes. So that is the premise that I am holding to as we seek to function as salt and light in this world in 2021. It is our mandate to engage and confront and love the world that God has made. Why is that? For his glory and for the furtherance of his kingdom. Jesus' words of commission have not been, been rescinded. They have not been retracted. They are to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that Christ has commanded. So we are to go and make disciples, lots of baptisms and lots of teaching. That is my focus for 2021. There are some here today, there are some that will hear this message online that need to receive Christ as Savior and become one of his disciples. And that is my prayer. There are some here that have intentions of getting baptized someday. I believe obedience and allegiance to Christ requires that 2021 is that year. There are some here today that have become complacent with regards to learning and understanding all the things that Christ has commanded. And so this requires us to go to school, to learn more of God's word, more Old Testament, more New Testament, more theology. This is not optional for the follower of Christ. Therefore, my focus for 2021 will not be nice and fluffy messages from this pulpit, Although nice sermons may produce nice Christians, what I would rather see is bold and sharp sermons that produce bold and sharp Christians. And so here is where we are going to be for the next several months. Today we begin a new series here at West Point, and so turn with me to the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Turn with me to Colossians. This letter, as all letters of the Word of God, is a masterpiece inspired by the Holy Spirit as a lasting letter for us to learn from. Paul wrote this letter while in prison, uh, most likely while in Rome. And just to give you a little bit of a context, um, Paul did not plant the church in Colossae. It is believed that while Paul was in Ephesus, preaching the gospel that many accepted Christ as Lord, including a man by the name of Epaphras. And then he carried the gospel to Colossae and thus planted the church there. It is believed that Paul never actually visited this city. But the reason Paul wrote this letter is that he had been informed of struggles looming over the church in Colossae. The church was in jeopardy. It appears that Epaphras himself made the long journey, possibly over a thousand miles, to Rome to inform Paul of what was going on in that city. And so the response is this letter, which was likely delivered by Tychicus and Onesimus, who are mentioned near the end of this letter. And so I'm going to do something, well, maybe it's not so different here, but I'm going to read the first couple chapters just to get a, an overall sense of uh, <clears throat> the reason, the content of this letter. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. 
All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that he has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory." We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Chapter 2, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form and you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature not with a circumcision done by the hands of men but with a circumcision done by Christ 
having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross." I love this. Verse 16, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. And let me just give a couple verses of chapter 3. Verse 1, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Amen. I hope you can see in this letter that there is a focus on the adequacy and sufficiency of Christ. I hope you can see from this reading that there is a warning against false teachings, against hollow and deceptive philosophy. And I hope that you can see from this reading that Paul is calling the church to a place of maturity and steadfastness in Christ. So let me give you a brief introduction to this letter, and then we will get into it in the weeks and months ahead. First, we see that Paul reminds the church of the adequacy and sufficiency of Christ. In Colossians 1, 15 to 20, we have this this focus on the supremacy of Christ. He is the image of the invisible invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. In him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, to reconcile to himself all things, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus Christ is sufficient He is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is over all, over thrones, powers, rulers, authorities. He is fully God. He is fully man. He is the great reconciler, reconciling to himself all things through his blood. His sacrifice is sufficient. His peace is sufficient. His victory over sin and death is sufficient. His knowledge and wisdom is sufficient. Paul reminds the church of the adequacy and sufficiency of Christ. Secondly, in this letter, we see a clear warning against false teachings that are circulating in their culture and threatening the church. This letter was written as a preventative measure to warn the church, to inform the church not to be deceived by false teachings and worldly wisdom. This warning comes so clearly in 
Chapter 2, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. And so we will spend several weeks with this verse in mind. But this verse tells us as believers in in that age, in, in any and every time period, that we are to be on guard from being kidnapped through philosophy that is born out of man's wisdom, not God's. And we all know that there are many that have been kidnapped, that have been taken captive. Consider Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, the remnant church, liberal Christianity, the health and wealth gospel, the social gospel that dismisses the actual gospel. And do you know what the common denominator is in all that I have just listed? They all claim to follow Jesus, and yet they have added man's wisdom to that gospel. And so Paul gives a clear warning against the threat of false teaching. And then lastly, this letter is a call to maturity and to steadfastness in Christ. And so allow me to close with this in mind. Colossians 1, 21 to 23, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. And so Paul reminds the church of that which is certain. Complete reconciliation is in Christ. We believe by faith that we have been cleansed and made right with God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul urges all believers to continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved, not shaken, not tossed back and forth by every wind and wave of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. And then we read this again in Colossians 2, 6 and 7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. And so in this series, we will focus on the adequacy and the sufficiency of Christ. We will make sure that we understand the gospel clearly. We will define these words of salvation and redemption and atonement. In this series, we will educate ourselves of the false teachings, both in Paul's day and in ours. And so what we'll do as we go through this letter is we will We will explain and and expose a false teaching that Paul is addressing, and then we will explain and expose a false teaching that is in our day and refute it as best we can. In this series, we will commit to the maturing process of every believer and that we would be steadfast in Christ. I believe 2021 will be a year to define our stand to be built up in unity, in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And So let me go back to what Jesus left his disciples with. He said, go and make disciples. If you are already a disciple, then you are to go and make disciples. If you are hearing these words and you have not yet committed your life to Jesus, then today may be the day that you accept Christ as Lord and Savior and King and you begin this journey of, to maturity. Secondly, Jesus says, go and baptize. 
And so there may be some here today who, or who are listening and they recognize that this is the year to be baptized. And so I would encourage you to make that declaration this year. Then lastly, Jesus said to go and to teach. So we go make disciples, we encourage baptism, and we, we teach, we come alongside, we walk with. And for each one of us, may we be committed to learning and teaching all that Christ has commanded us. And so my prayer for us is that we would make the most of 2021, that we would use it to define our stand, and that we will bring much glory and honor to our King and further His kingdom. Please stand with me. I'd like to call up the worship team. And I'm just going to be at the front here if anyone would like to talk to me, to pray with me, to let me know when they want to, would like to be baptized. I look forward to those conversations in the days and weeks ahead of us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time in your word. I thank you for the masterpiece that is Colossians, a, a manifesto of rising up to uh, address the teachings that come at the church. And so, Father, I pray for each one of us that we would dig in this year, that we would learn things that we've never considered important enough to learn, but that we would learn it so that we can explain and refute that which is false and point more and more people to the goodness and greatness of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, I pray for those that are hearing these words that need to bow before you, to bow before Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and King. Would you do that by your Spirit? Father, I pray for those that are saying, I think I need to get baptized this year. Would you give courage, give clarity to them at this time? We love you, Jesus. We want to make your name great. And so help us in this, we, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jared, for that message. Let's sing the old rugged cross for Christ.